Great, thank you. Now for all of us, there are certain moments in our lives that uh, change the way we think about things. There are certain defining events or bits of wisdom that are imparted by other people. They either make us look at things differently to the way we did before, or they reinforce our existing beliefs and, um, and make us more sure of ourselves. And for me, one of those events was in a home economics class in year seven. <laughs> and we were given an exercise of designing an optimal kitchen layout. And so we had to work out the position of the stove, position of the fridge, where the workspace would be, all of that sort of thing. And then we had to do a bit of time and motion study. And this was the, uh, the first time I'd ever been exposed to this concept and the whole idea of usability and thinking about how things are arranged for optimal efficiency. And it was a silly little class exercise, like over in half an hour. But it was one of those things that stuck with me. And it's, um, it's led to what some people would call probably rather obsessive behaviors. Um, for example, when I'm loading the dishwasher, I always pre-sort the cutlery because it's faster to do that than to sort it when you're taking it back out. And <laughs> and when I'm putting times into the microwave, I always do multiples of 11 seconds because there's less seek time on the keypad. <laughs> But it, there's actually another reason for that. There's a double reason. My previous microwave, <laughs> yeah, OCD, yes. Um, my previous microwave had a feature where when it had finished cooking, it would continue turning um, until it had returned everything back to the front. It had about an 11.4 second cycle time. <laughs> so what happens is if you put in, say, 20 seconds, you've got to wait 2.8 seconds from the time it cooks to the time it says it's ready. Whereas at 22 seconds, you've only got to wait 0.8. So it's much, much better. <laughs> So my very first LCA was not far from here at UQ. And one of the, um, one of the keynotes was Michi Henning, who talked about computing fallacies and usability and all of the stupid things that are done uh, when people really should know better. And one of the things he brought up was this issue of user interfaces in the real world, physical environment, so natural interface. And the obvious one is door handles. I mean, a door is something that we go through dozens of times a day. Why should we need instructions to know how to use a door? That's just stupid. And so the question that he put to the audience was, what is the optimal design for a door that you've got to push to go through? And so someone, give me an answer. Plate. Yeah, a flat plate, exactly. So I was already thinking along these lines when um, when I saw this keynote back in 2002. So it sort of reinforced my obsession with this sort of thing. And um, it, over time, I ended up with this sort, of, sort of mantra, which is the best UI is no UI. Everything should disappear and it should simply do exactly what it is meant to do at the right time. It should not necessarily take conscious thought to make something behave in a logical way. Um, objects should be context aware and they should be intent aware. But of course, that's really, really difficult to achieve. Um, so one of the things um, that I did, oh, and this comes back to the door example once again. Okay, think about a door. So Mishi's example was the best interface for a door is a flat plate. So you simply push it, it's unambiguous. But if you think back more fundamentally to what a door does, think about all the, the um, the states it needs to be in and the reasons it should be in that state. If I want to walk through it, I want the door to be open. I shouldn't have to do anything, it should just not be there. If I'm not walking through it and it's windy, I want it to be closed so that you know, dust and the neighbor's cat don't come in. And if um, Joe Burglar comes and tries to open the door, it shouldn't open for him. So it should be open in some cases, closed in others, locked in some cases, lock unlocked in other cases. Or maybe it's in the evening and the house, the air in the house is hot and outside it's started to cool down. So you want the door to be open to allow a cool breeze to come in. <coughs> All these sorts of scenarios. But the door itself should be able to take care of this. You shouldn't have to think about it. So one of the things that I set out to do was to remove keys. I wanted doors to simply be unlocked when I went through them and to be locked whenever anybody else tried to go through them. Now I'm not going to dwell on this because I've already done lots of talks about this sort of stuff. Um, so a few years ago, I implanted an RFID tag in my arm, partly to experiment with this sort of thing. 
partly also to figure out um, some of the exploits and things associated with it. So the end result is that, for me, my front door is unlocked all the time. I can walk up to it empty-handed and it just lets me in. For other people, it happens to be locked. Um, so I won't go into that in any more detail because a lot of you have already heard me talk about that. But one of the, one of the interesting little side stories is that there's some really cool stuff on eBay nowadays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine a few months ago bought an ultrasound machine on eBay. So he set it up in his garage. We have a nice little surgery in there now. And, um, and so, of course, we go into his garage and just scan random things, see what we can see. And so this is a scan of my arm. And the crosses up in the top show the position of the RFID tag, which is just under the skin. So that was verifying. Yes, it really is still there. It hasn't gone away. Um, but on the theme of things behaving automatically. Some of you may remember, how many people were at the Myth TV Miniconf a couple of years ago? A few of you. Okay, I did a talk there about um, presence awareness for Myth TV. And I'd done a little experiment at the time where I had an infrared badge, like an infrared transmitter that sent out a, a beacon. So you clip the badge on, there's a receiver at the TV. If the TV sees the receiver, then it knows you're there. And if you stand up, walk out of the room, TV pauses. And um, you can extend that a little bit further and have follow me as well. So you walk out of one room and then into another room and your show pops up on the TV that, of the room that you walked into. <laughs> she thinks it's pretty cool. Um, but it's got a few problems. Firstly, sticking a badge on is just naff. and stupid. And at the time, I, um, I said I wanted to experiment with a bit of face detection and things like that. So I've been doing that and um, it actually works pretty well. There's a little webcam sitting up on top of the TV. And this is, once again, an example of the environment around you simply doing what it should do without you having to decide, I am going to pause the TV or I need to do something to make it, uh, make it behave the way it should. And so let's try this out. This is probably going to be one of those big demo fail moments, but hey, that's what makes this fun. So let's stick up a movie. Now, no normally I do this with Myth TV, but I don't have Myth TV on my laptop, so um, I just run up M Player. And when I was trying this earlier, it was having a hell of a time with the lighting conditions in here. So we will see what happens. Yeah. Okay, so what we should have now, bring that to the foreground, is if it sees me in front of it or if it detects any faces, the movie should play. And if I walk away, it's probably going to detect faces in random patterns on the wall now. Then the movie pauses. And it requires a number of consecutive frames. So I've set it up with several consecutive frames um, so that false um, positives don't trigger. At the moment, it's triggering like crazy in this room, but it actually is not that bad in the lounge room. <laughs> Inconceivable. So that actually works okay. So this is um, just one of the little things that I've done experimenting with trying to, um, to make the world behave the way it should. Um, and so there are all sorts of sensors and control interfaces and things like that that you can, you can bring into use. And part of the point of this, and this is something I've said in previous talks as well, is to think of everything as modular. So think of the world as Lego. You can have a whole lot of different actuators. You can have a whole lot of different sensors. You can have different ways of controlling things. And once you start putting these various elements into place, you can then tie them together in new ways. So if you already have an actuator in place to control something in your physical environment, if you dream up a new way of controlling it, it's then a relatively simple thing to tie it together. And then you can get different behaviors. And one of the most interesting things to come out um, recently, um, I'll tell you a little story about it. So a long time ago, in a universe far, far away, a powerful empire had plans for a new game console, Peripheral. And this thing is actually really, really cool. I mean, I know there are, at this sort of conference, there are people that like to bash Microsoft, but in this case, they have built some amazing hardware. This stuff is really, really cool. What they've done is taken technology that was previously only available to uh, researchers at a very high price point, and they've produced it literally in the millions. I think they sold a million in the first 14 days or something. And that's pulled the price point down to the point where research equipment that you used to have to spend many thousands of dollars for, you can now get for 190 ish dollars. And you can walk into a store and buy it. And it's got some really interesting stuff in it. 
Um, there's an accelerometer, which may sound kind of stupid for something that you stick on front of your TV and never touch, um, but there's a reason for that. Um, there's a pitch control servo, so it can adjust its angle. And the idea is that you can put it down and it will self-level. So you can, and you can also have it track faces and things like that. It's got a 640 by 480 RGB camera in it, so you can do regular uh, video pickup. And it also has a four-way microphone array, which in itself is really interesting. I haven't done anything with this yet, um, but it, it has a lot of potential. The, one of the major problems you have when you're picking up audio from a large room is that you get everything. You get the echoes, and um, you get ambient noise, and you get multiple people talking. So if you're trying to do, um, say, voice control, or if you want to have a Skype conversation with someone on your TV and you're standing there talking to them, and someone else is talking in the background, you get all sorts of problems with sound. Sound is one of those things that is really, really hard to do right. I mean, I'm, Julian, I'm sure, would agree with me on this one. But people underestimate how difficult it is to get audio working correctly. What they've done with this is put in a four-way uh, four micro microphone array so they can actually do spatial analysis of the sound and distinguish the position that the sound comes from in the room and cancel out everything else. So what they could do is use the, um, the position derived from uh, things like video sensors and the depth sensor and then ignore sound that comes from anywhere else. So you could stand in a noisy room and talk and your voice would be picked up clearly. Uh, it also has a, um, an IR camera, which is 11 bit, so 2048 uh, levels and um, a structured light IR projector. And this is where stuff gets really, really interesting. The way this works is a little bit like radar. Um, it's a technique called LIDAR, so it uses light instead of radio waves. Um, but instead of using uh, time to reflect, like radar, what it does is use dispersal of light pattern across a surface to detect um, distance and deformation. So the way to think about this is imagine that there is a grid of little colored dots, infrared dots, being projected out from this in a cone. And as the dots strike objects that are further away, they'll be further apart. And so with the infrared camera, by doing analysis of the position of the dots in the image, it makes it really easy to get the distance to any object that is in front of the camera. And that is really cool. So let's try that and see how it works. Um, did I get, yeah, okay, so actually, and I'll tell you, before I get to that, I'll tell you a, um, a little story about how the, um, the drivers for this came about because it is actually kind of intriguing. Um, November 4th was when this was launched. And on the day it was launched, uh, Lemore Freed, who many of you will know from Adafruit, who's a, just a little hardware company in the US, uh, thought it would be a cool peripheral for robotics projects. So she bought one and ran a USB packet sniffer on it and thought, yeah, this looks like it's got some good stuff in it, but I don't have time to write drivers, so I want someone else to do it. So later that day, she published the, US, the packet dumps, and this was at 3.40 p.m., and offered a $1,000 bounty to the first person to release an open source driver for it. Um, CNET got on the case really, really fast, called their local Microsoft rep, and they made a statement 20 minutes later <laughs> saying, Microsoft will continue to make advances in these types of safeguards and work closely with law enforcement and product safety groups to keep Connect Tampa resistant. <laughs> okay, so they don't want anybody messing with their stuff. So um, an hour later, they more increased the bounty. <laughs> And over the next couple of days, there was a bit of discussion about it, and she thought about the implications of, okay, she's putting up money for someone to reverse engineer something, and Microsoft really does not like this. So she increased it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was after the US launch on November the 4th. What happened next was that the, um, the European launch was scheduled for November the 10th. And on November the 10th, they went on sale in stores in a number of places, including Spain. And this pleasant looking gentleman named Hector Martin walked into a store uh, about nine o'clock on that morning. And he's a pleasant looking chap. Um, but he doesn't actually own an Xbox, he just wanted to buy the Kinect. Um, but what he is, is one of the members of the, um, the group that reverse engineered the Sony DRM on the PS3. <laughs> At noon he published video proof and source code of a working driver. <laughs> So 
So later that day, Lee Moore says, you've done it. And not only did he get $3,000, she decided that because of the threat um, to people's rights to, um, to reverse engineer and to develop interoperability with existing products, she donated an extra $2,000 to the EFF. Um, so then Microsoft made a statement saying the interface was open by design. <laughs> and they were inspired. <laughs> okay, of course, it's a big company. They don't talk internally and stuff like that. But I thought it was, uh, when you look at it in a, as a microcosm like that, it's quite an interesting little sequence of events. So this is what it actually does. What we're looking at here are the two video streams. One on the left is the depth camera. One on the right is the RGB camera. And there are some really interesting things you can see out of this. What this is doing is applying false color mapping to the, um, the depth values that are coming out of the camera. So the closer something is to the camera, the hotter it is. Now, there are a few things you'll notice here. If you look at my hand, for example, in that picture, it's reasonably close in color to the wall behind me. And you'll also notice that there are things like a hard line intersecting fingers. So if you are applying um, you know, edge detection algorithms and things like that, they have a bit of trouble with the RGB image. So one of the interesting things about this is not just that it allows a whole new class of approaches to solving problems, but it means you can take um, existing problem-solving approaches and things, you know, things in OpenCV, for example, instead of throwing the algorithm at the RGB values, throw them at the depth values, and all of a sudden it works really, really well. So as you can see, depth, um, edge detection is a piece of cake when you're dealing with the, uh, the depth values. So I'll fire it up and we'll see it working for real. So as I get closer, you can see it gets hotter. Hey, let's have a look at you guys. Hey. At this sort of technology, six months ago, you would have been paying many, many thousands of dollars for something that could do anything even remotely like that. So that is really, really cool. Um, and this, what I'm running right now is the example application um, that Hector released as part of his, uh, that runs with his driver. So this is with the, um, the open source driver. Um, so what I did was started mucking around with, uh, with things like hand tracking and mapping um, 3D zones in space to various actions. And it can start bending your brain a little bit. Um, I'm not used to dealing with these sorts of things, so um, it was quite a stretch for me. But basically what's happening is that the camera itself is outputting, like if, for example, you run a, um, a hand tracking system, you end up with X, Y, Z coordinates of whatever, whatever your point of interest is, so say your hand. Um, but they are projective coordinates, they're not absolute coordinates. So if you think about a room being a cube with X, Y, Z axes on it, it is not an absolute position that's the same everywhere, um, throughout, or a scale the same everywhere throughout it. Because we're, what we're looking at is a conical field of view, well, it's actually a slightly flattened cone, an x value, which is the horizontal value, will be a different offset depending on how far away you are from it. So an x offset on the edge of the field of view will actually move in towards the edge. So when you start defining volumes of space, it can become a bit brain bending. Um, but I drew lots of sketches and worked out some um, some positions and played around with it. So just as a demo of this, we've, um, we've got a thing hooked up. This is um, another major opportunity for demo fail, so this could be fun. Um, so what we're doing here is I'm running the, um, the hand tracking software. And there are a number of points in space, and be careful not to walk in front of it right now. There are a number of points of space that have been defined as having different uh, meanings. When it detects one of those events, there's a little, um, it's a loop basically which has a little state machine in it. So when it detects a transition of, say, your hand moving into a hot zone, it then um, sends a network connection, which is going through at the moment to Andy's laptop sitting down the bottom there, which is associated wirelessly with the parrot. So if I... I'll angle that up a little bit. What do I have that I can sit it on? Pen will do. I think the self-leveler ran and mucked it up. Okay, so let's see if I can get it to detect my hand. So I can now send an up command and then push.
come to me, my pretty. <laughs> you know, in practice, we got it to work about one time in ten. I had no expectation it was going to work. Um, actually, I'll just go back on that one. No, oh, back. OK, so one of the problems that you have, what you would have noticed is that when I was doing this, I was looking back at the computer screen the whole time. And I was watching the, what you were seeing, which was the position that it was interpreting my hand as being, and trying to figure out where my hand is relative to those hot zones in space. Because the thing is, if you wave your hands around, you go into a hot zone, like you have a transition into it, it sends an event. That is really, really annoying. And something that I discovered as soon as I started playing with this is that it's hard to have any sort of interface that doesn't give you any feedback. Like we're used to, um, to either physical feedback if we're dealing with physical devices or with some kind of visual feedback if we're using software or maybe Audible or something like that. And so um, over the Christmas holidays, I was relaxing and um, playing with the kids' Christmas presents and, <laughs> and getting an inspiration. And um, one of the things I realized is that in a computer game, they often highlight, for example, if you're running through a virtual environment and there are multiple objects that you can have uh, an action on, then when you select it, often it will have like a blue glow or something so you know, okay, that's the, action, that's the object I've selected so I can open that door using the force, and then I can run through and zap all the, um, the guards. And so I decided that it was worth giving it a go. I would try to replicate that sort of visual feedback, but in the physical world. So because I've already got a bunch of things at home that are connected to actuators and the home automation system, I set up some high-intensity blue LEDs so that if I select an object, the object glows blue, so I can tell what I've selected. <laughs> Slow curtains, yes, I know. <laughs> um, this was one of the other things that... <laughs> Playing with the curtains. Uh, so what you're actually looking at in that last little demo of the, the curtains is the connect connected to a machine running Ubuntu, which is talking um, via the, local, the LAN in my house. And I have an Arduino-compatible board called a 2010 and a an Ethernet adapter on it, which is using power over Ethernet. And that's embedded basically outside the wall where the, um, the curtains are. And it's exposing a web services interface. So when the Ubuntu machine sees an event, uh, it can then just sends a connection to the web services interface, which then fires off the appropriate physical actuators. And I have it connected to the high intensity blue LEDs above the curtains, and also to big 240 volt relays that fire the, um, the curtain motors so they control it to run up and down. And it's got a feedback mechanism and timers and things like that, interlocks built into it. So you can't do, uh, you can't make a mistake like I did originally and try to activate both up and down simultaneously on the motors. They don't like that. <laughs> but there are big downsides to this. There is a problem here. Well, there are several problems here. <laughs> Firstly, pretty, isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't exactly blend in with the decor. Um, the other big problem, of course, is look at what's invisible in the mirror there. So you're sitting on the toilet and you're looking at a camera. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you explain to people that there is no human watching this video stream. <laughs> there is a computer analyzing the scene and doing stuff. It, it still just creeps people out. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, that's not so good. Um, there's some other stuff in that, that picture that I've also linked up. We have a just-in-time hot water system. So it's a hot water service that um, you punch in the temperature you want and the, it comes out at that temperature. So what I've done was got an extra controller and I've hacked into it and um, once again I've got a little Arduino and some relays controlling it so that instead of having to go over and set the water temperature uh, I can do things like have the connect um, determine if I've walked into the shower. So if I go to the shower 
It goes, hmm, he's going to have a shower. I'll set it to 42 degrees, and the temperature changes. Um, so all sorts of different things like that that you can do. There are other sensors as well that I've been playing around with. Um, I mean, the Kinect is really cool, but there are lots of sensors that are much simpler and that don't draw about two amps and, um, and don't freak people out looking at a camera. Things like IR range sensors are fantastic. I've used a heap of these. Uh, they're only a few dollars each, and it's a reflective sensor. So what happens is that they're quite small. Uh, you can attach it to something or hide it behind something. And it'll give you a reading which is proportional to the distance of whatever object is in front of it. Um, so I can do things like attach that to um, a surface and then you wave in front of it and it detects your hand has passed in front of it and you can then trigger off actuators to do things like um, close a drawer in the kitchen by waving at it. Um, which is what you do with things like this. Uh, <laughs> this is a pneumatic actuator. Um, the sysadmin at the company I work at now um, used to work in pneumatics and uh, he has lots and lots of knowledge of this sort of stuff. So um, he arranged a... Uh, one, uh, one of these for me to experiment with. So what you can see there is the, um, it's a bi-directional, so a push-pull pneumatic actuator in the bottom and a bunch of hose. There are some um, pressure bleed valves there. And the grey block in the middle with the fittings coming off it is a, um, a two-way solenoid. So I can control the, um, the piston. And you may, you probably didn't notice, but in the previous video where we were looking at the curtains being closed in the bathroom, you may have noticed that those um, windows are actually held closed with sticky tape right now. Um, that is because I'm intending to put electric, either electric or pneumatic actuators in there because I want to be able to, uh, you know, wave the curtains up and then push the windows open. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yes, you have been warned. <laughs> um, if anybody has ideas for other things that could be done with this, I would love to hear them. And there is some really, really cool stuff happening with hacking the Connect at the moment. Uh, so there are some sites there that you can check out and see lots of cool projects and videos. Um, there are also, there's a video, actually I'll stick it up now. Um, there are some videos that we took this morning just in case um, stuff didn't work. And of course we had stuff that didn't work. So there are a few crashes and things like that. And there's also a video up um, that actually did work. So I'll put those URLs back up in a moment. Um, yeah, there was a gentleman here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a two-way mirror. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> it is rather more creepy. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, it won't hurt them. <laughs> yes, um, Julian, you had a comment? Have you added ambient light sensors so your obnoxious blue glow isn't extremely obnoxious when it's 3 a.m. and you're hungover? <laughs> I'm never hung over at 3 a.m. Um, no, uh, I haven't actually. I've, at the moment, I've just got them running hard on. I could pulse with modulate them or something like that. The problem I've got is not actually turning them down. It's getting them bright enough to be seen in daylight. Um, I've got some here, so I'll pull them out later if anybody's interested. But I've actually used multiple strips of high-intensity blue LEDs, um, you know, stuck end to end, and angled them so they're reflecting back against the wall so that they're visible. And even then, in broad daylight, it's not really obvious when they are activated. Um, but one thing, actually, it's um, quite handy having some form of illumination to walk around the house when it's, uh, when it's dark. Oh, and this was the other video of stuff that did work. I'll show you that one as well. Um, any more questions, or are you ready to start hurling those tomatoes? Have you uh, thought that some of the possible long-term consequences of things like those automatic doors is like people will forget how a door actually works? <laughs> um, you, think you we'll get to a point where there is a, a pirate down in the house and people don't know how to get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose there's always that danger. Um, thinking forward, I and mean, this is starting to get into the realm of real conjecture here. Uh, if you take what I've been talking about to you know, it, its logical conclusion, where the entire world around you simply does what it should do, I mean, we're starting to talk about things like the technological singularity here. Imagine, for example, I wanted to sit down. I should be able to just sit down and there should be a chair there. I shouldn't have to... It should just be there. And it wasn't there three seconds ago. Um, there are all sorts of things that, that can be achieved with technology to, um, to make your world react to you. I'll stick those URLs back up. Um, yeah? How well does it work in bright sun outside? Um, the Connect? Yeah, like it's IR. 
lighter? Um, I haven't used it outside, actually. That's a good, that's a good question. I've yeah. used it in brightly lit rooms, like with sunlight coming through, and it seems to be OK in that. Um, Sorry? Better in low light generally? Yeah. Well, one of the advantages of it one is that it actually does work in total darkness. And um, so there are applications for it for security monitoring and various things like that that are quite cool. Uh, yes, question up there. Um, have you uh, recently was looking at the video of the Connect controlling a VMware ESX and the gentleman's just like turning the ESX on, turning it off, <laughs> um, changing clusters, etc. Have you um, played with it with controlling software? So controlling, um, you know, the hardware through software. Yeah, um, like I have a little bit. and stuff. I have a little bit, and um, I was intending to do something for this presentation, and I chickened out because my presentation remote died um, during the Arduino MiniConf. And last night I was sitting there thinking, I could link this so that I could change slides. <laughs> and then um, I thought, no, I've got more pressing things to do, so I did other preparation instead. Um, but yeah, you, you can basically you can do anything you like with it. Um, like what we've been, what Andy and I were just doing then was when it detected an event, it sent a, um, a network connection, but it, it could do anything you like. Yes? Have you uh, tried, uh, regarding your earlier demo where you stopped or paused the video by walking out of frame from the camera, have you tried combining the two? Because obviously with the Connect, you can have a better chance of face recognition because you can tell from context that the thing that's in the foreground is probably your head. Yeah. Um, in fact, I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine. Uh, when I first got the Connect, one of the very first things he said was, um, if you really break it down, you don't even need to do face detection anymore. Because what you do is use the Connect to do a 3D volumetric analysis of the room, and you have a baseline. And if, you, if someone walks into the room, it doesn't matter if they're lying on the couch with their back to the TV, you still know the volume has changed. And so you can figure out, OK, there's someone in the room. Um, so, yeah, I haven't tried it yet, but there are some interesting things that could be done with that. Yes? Um, so, I gather that Microsoft's Connect stuff does things like skeleton tracking. Is there any um, yeah, um, on that? Yeah, there are um, open tools for doing that now as well. I could demo that. Um, there are a whole bunch of things. I could just play around with this while people are asking questions. How close are we on time? Uh, Ten minutes? Okay. We have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um. John, um, eye tracking. Like, I've always wanted Focus Follows Eyeball. Um, can you see that being doable in the near future? Eye tracking. The resolution is not that great. Um, one of the... Woo, uh, one of the... One of the things I heard was that they actually degraded the resolution because they simply discovered it wasn't necessary for the games they wanted to run on the Xbox. And so one of the slight niggles about this is that this is a great piece of hardware, but it could have been just that much bit better. Um, maybe we'll see some more high-res ones come out. Actually, another interesting thing is that originally it's not Microsoft technology. It's uh, from a company called PrimeSense who did a whole lot of early work with, uh, with skeleton tracking and depth analysis and various other things. And so what Microsoft have done is taken the PrimeSense reference design and implemented it. Uh, PrimeSense have now been contracted to, I believe it might be ASUS or someone like that, and there is another version of this coming out um, developed by PrimeSense probably in the second quarter of this year. So right now this is the only game in town, but I expect that now that uh, everybody's realizing how cool this is, that'll change pretty fast. And then we might see specs increase, we'll see a greater resolution and other things. OK. Um, yeah, I think that might be just one of their reference designs. But the one that they're working on at the moment is going to be, well, it's going to be like a mass market product. You'll be able to buy it in Kmart or wherever. I didn't know about that. Maybe they have. Um, last I heard was I had a contract to um, produce this design for another company. Um, there is actually a skeleton tracking example here somewhere as well. Uh, John, yeah. uh, also on a, I guess a similar line, can you see uh, Microsoft building it into, I don't know, Windows Phone 8, 9 or 10, um, basically enabling you to do similar gestures from your mobile device? Is it like, do you know what the, what's the processing power in the, in the uh, box? The, what was discovered is that, um, I was actually just talking to Bot about this before um, the session, 
their original concept was that it was going to take an awful lot of processing power within the Connect itself in order to do the analysis and then um, send the final results through to whatever device was connected to it, so the Xbox or whatever. And it was discovered that it took far less CPU power than was expected. And in the, um, so they actually had provision early on for an extra processor and some other stuff directly within the Connect to do onboard scene analysis. And they found they didn't need to, so they ripped that hardware out. Um, and it only uses a few percent of the Xbox's CPU in order to, um, to do all the stuff that you know, you're seeing here and a whole lot more. So it would be quite conceivable from the point of view of a CPU point of view um, to do this in a small device. The big problem is that these things take a lot of juice. Um, they're actually using a lot of power. Like I wasn't kidding earlier when it pulls a couple of amps. You can't run it directly off your computer. It needs um, a power booster in order to run it. So, and they get quite hot. Like you can feel they're physically hot. There's a little fan inside it. Um, it must be cranking out quite a lot of IR in order to, um, to throw spots of light you know, six metres away and then be able to analyse it. What, what's with the... Um, Sorry, where is this? Over here. What's with the shadow on the false colour depth? It, ah. it looks like you actually have a shadow when you shouldn't. Yes, that technically is a shadow. Um, in that it is an area that is occluded. Because what we're seeing is the, um, the projection you know, of the points from a fixed point, um, if I stand here and uh, there will be a shadow basically behind the area. Yep. Yeah, g'day. What's the go with the four-way microphone array you said? Have people made use of that yet with the open source drivers? or is it I, still I haven't heard of anybody on? doing anything with it. Um, I know there's been some work investigating how it works. Um, there have been, there's been a lot of releases of the open drivers just recently, so there may be better support for it now. Uh, the early version, I don't think, the version of the drivers that I started playing with, which was right after um, it was released, had no support for it at all. Um, has anybody done anything with the microphones on this? Anyone clarify? Does it happen to be a array? I don't know. <laughs> You're an audio geek. Okay, so audio is binary blobs. No one's been able to do anything with it. Was the answer? <laughs> hey. Yes. Hey, John. Um, hey, how, is, how is it supporting multiple people trying to interface with the same device? Are you just single person interface at the moment, or? Um, no. If in fact, if I did um, players, someone else come down the front, please. Okay, so I'm player one. I need player two. Oh, yeah, now it's doing, yeah, it's now doing, uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry. I think, that's, I think that's Andy messing with my head. <laughs> so you can see it's doing, it's doing a skeleton tracking of some sort here. It probably is, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's very confused. So yeah, it, you can have support for multiple people and um, skeleton tracking and various things as well. Um, yeah, who's got the microphone? Yep, Luke. Um, have you ever tried um, taking apart the Connect hardware, for example, maybe looking at hacking it or repackaging the casing to suit your bathroom decor better or anything <laughs> like that? Um, I haven't pulled this one apart. Um, I've seen a few teardowns online. People have done, put a bit of work into that. There does seem to be a fair bit of space in it that isn't necessary, um, partly, I think, because they're trying to get separation for the microphones. So if it was trimmed down to just the cameras, it could probably be you know, a third that length. Yeah, easier to hide, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're out of questions, so thank you very much.